So there's another approach which is often uh, now taken into account in uh, in bigger systems, especially system on chips, and it's called active skew management, de-skewing or something like that. So then the EV7, this is what they did. They decided, okay, we're going to make different skew areas. So we know that these areas, they're going to be talking to each other, they're going to be, uh, but they're mainly going to be self-sufficient. So we'll decide that we're going to have a clock grid over this area, we're going to have a clock grid over this area, this area, and this area, and now we don't actually have have to have them uh, sit on the same tree. What we can do is we can put a uh, DLL in between them and we can make sure that we fix the phase between each of these areas and de-skew um, uh, de -skew them. But we'll build the clock grid separately, lowering the complexity of each clock grid. And that's a way to do it. I'll explain to a DLL uh, towards the end of the class today. Okay. Um, and a similar approach is uh, Intel Itanium, and every company kind of calls this stuff uh, uh, in their own way, especially Intel tends to make up uh, names that are different from the rest of the industry. So they call these DLLs uh, DSKs or de-skewing elements. And what they have here is their PLL that drives a bunch of these de-skewing elements, which each one of them drives this regional grid, which uh, can ha have flip-flops hanging off of it. So it's a very similar approach to what they did here in the Alpha, and that's how it was done in the Itanium. But I am uh, ripping up my piece of paper here and throwing it away, and I'll introduce something else. Um, but I want to ask you, what is the main goal of clock tree synthesis? So we're trying as hard as we can to minimize skew. That's what all of the previous slides did. We're trying to minimize skew. On the way, we're burning power, we're wasting area, we're really suffering from high insertion delay, and, uh, et cetera. But is minimum skew our actual goal? I mean, why do we want to make minimum skew? Why are we minimizing skew in the first place? And that takes us to this nice um, little chart I found here on the internet somewhere that says that there's this uh, circle here of things that matter. There's this circle here of things you control. And we should really focus on kind of the uh, part that we can control that matters. We shouldn't be focusing on things that we can control that don't really matter. So why are we trying to minimize skew? Let's see if we can forget what we, we actually want to do. Our real goals are not skew. Our real goals are meeting timing. We have our um, set up and hold uh, paths, our set up and hold equations. That's what we want to meet. And we also want to meet our DRV constraints, DRV being uh, design rule violations, uh, like the, our minimum, uh, our maximum uh, fan out or our maximum capacitance and uh, maximum transition and so forth. Those are the things that we want to meet on our clock tree. In fact, the reason that we actually are trying to, uh, to um, to minimize skew is because we didn't take skew into account at all pre-clock tree synthesis. And we met our timing and so forth, and we want to go and make our clock tree and keep our ideal type of a clock. And our ideal type of a clock will mean that there's no skew. It won't actually affect what we uh, calculated before. But that was our goal. But is it worth this power area and high insertion delay that we were hitting. Um, so again, minimizing skew is just to correlate the post-CTS and pre-CTS timing. But maybe we should just consider timing while building our clock tree and try to fix this. So this is an approach that Cadence uh, takes into account when they use their what they call the clock concurrent optimization. And it's a completely different approach than um, the, the, the zero skew approach that we have uh, CTS that we've been discussing up till now, and which is our traditional way to build a clock tree. So what is clock concurrent optimization? What is the methodology of CCopt? First, we're going to build a clock tree and fix DRVs. So we have our N sinks that we discussed before. What we're going to do is we're going to go and buffer our clock net in order to meet our max fan out, max capacitance, max transition constraints. Okay. After we do that, we're going to check timing. We're going to check setup and hold. And if there are any violations, we're going to fix them. That's basically our methodology for CCopt. And why is this a good approach? Well, most of the timing paths are local. Remember this little chart I showed you before? All of these guys, that's where most of the timing paths are going between them. And they're going to be getting their um, clock source from, you know, one of these buffers or, or a set of buffers that aren't far away. So the skew between them won't be high, and therefore we probably won't run into that big of setup and hold violations due to skew, and maybe we can overcome them with some sizing and, and, so, and some optimization. Um, the, the, the number of kind of paths that we have that are actually crossing all these, there aren't that many of them. So we can just look at them and try to fix them uh, according to what we need using type of things like useful skew, adding some skew on the uh, on the clock uh, in order to fix either a setup or a hold violation. 
So if we don't do skew balancing, which is what is being proposed here, we'll have a lower insertion delay because our insertion delay is not set by our worst um, uh, our farthest away type of flip-flop. It's set by however we need to just fix the DRVs to get there. And that, if we have less insertion delay, it means we have less RC. Less RC is less power. It also means we have less jitter because jitter is caused by the number of elements that we have along the way, and we have less elements, so we get less jitter. And that's good. We have fewer clock buffers, right? Fewer clock buffers means we have uh, less power and less area that they take up. The distribution of peak current is this kind of a non-trivial approach that we can see. Well, if we look at a digital system over time, what we're going to see here is uh, if we look at the uh, power consumption or the current consumption, what we're going to see is every once in a while we're going to have this like uh, rise. Now, what is that rise in power? That's when our clock rises, right? So if a clock rises, uh, we'll probably have something like that. Right? When our clock rises at these points, what's going to happen is our flip-flops are going to uh, sample whatever was here, move it over to the other side. This is going to go uh, travel through our, uh, our, our um, combinational uh, stuff and get to our next flip-flop. Right? And then things are going to sit statically until the next clock rises. So everything is really going on right here. And that's here where we, we first sample our stuff. It takes a lot of current. And then we start driving it through our sequential elements until we get to kind of a steady state where we're not wasting much power. Okay, that's really bad because it means that our peak power is really high. If we're not skew balanced, then this clock edge is actually scattered all around, right? And then we'll have smaller little peaks that are scattered all around and our peak power gets much lower. We're going to still probably have the same average type of power except for the difference in, in the power on the clock tree. But, but our, our peak power is going to go down and that's really nice. It also it leads to less IR drop and so forth. And finally, um, we're going to use a heavy dose of useful skew. So as I said before, useful skew is actually skewing the uh, clock that gets to each of the flip-flops in order to help our setup and hold constraints. And we can reach higher f clock frequencies, for example, by using useful skew rather than the traditional approach of useful skew, which meant let's first balance our clock tree and then we'll maybe incrementally add a bit of useful skew to improve, to maybe reach a higher timing target. Okay, um, that leads us to our Chip Hall of Fame chapter of, of this lecture. And here, since we already decided to discuss uh, the, the deck alpha in some of the previous slides, I, I just it's a really important type of an architecture that came up. They introduced a ton of novelty in, in digital equipment core. Um, and it included things like clocking that we discussed here. So the alpha architecture and the first chip that uh, the first alpha chip that deck put out was this 21064. And w why did they call it this strange name? So I think that's a cool thing. Well, it was a 21st century ready 64 bit zero generation architecture. So that's why it's called the 21064. Um, it was released in 1992. It was a 64 bit architecture. The architecture was called alpha. Okay, and the process was their own. The Dex uh, Fabs were making a, a CMOS four process. They called it, and it was an 0.75 micron process. It had three metal layers. They used the 3.3 uh, volt power supply, and the the chip ran up to about 200 megahertz. It had one and a half million transistors or so. It had 232 millimeter die size, and it was priced at the low price of only three thousand dollars. Right. So at the time of introduction, the alphas were the world's fastest. Chip. Chips. Um, every generation that came out was faster than the, the last one, and they were really groundbreaking. They were really leading the pack. Um, De uh, DEC was an acquired by Compaq in 1998, and little by little, uh, Compaq decided to phase out the Alpha architecture and chose to use the Intel Antanium architecture instead. Um, I just wanted to mention that the DEC Alpha has not yet been inducted to the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame, but I imagine that one day it will be.